All right. All right, let's do it. Okay. Okay, guys. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So it's me again, Evan. The reason why I have this vlog is to share to you what happened to my first day of clinical rotation for the adults or uh, chronic cases or illnesses. All right. So forgive me. I have a little cheat sheet right here. So I want to touch base like 10 diagnoses um, that is kind of common in the primary care, at least for today. Um, first is hypertension, high lipids or high cholesterol, urinary tract infection, diabetes, obesity, bronchitis in patients with a tonsillar cancer and also atopic dermatitis, secondary to um, chemo radiation, also depression and also gout. All right, first of all is hypertension. So first question, I know a lot of people will wonder, when am I diagnosed as having hypertension? So it has to be a sustained elevation of systolic blood pressure of anything more than 140 or a diastolic blood pressure of anything more than 90. So basically if it's more than 140 over 90 in two consecutive occasions or two consecutive um, times in three separate occasions. So, so let's put it this way. You went to the doctor for three times and you they check your blood pressure for twice and it's still more than 140 over 90. So that's it. And also as for the diagnosis, there are certain guidelines that we want to follow. There is a joint national committee or JNC7 or JNC8. So for the JNC7, they have classifications. Their normal is 120 over 80. So the JNC7 guidelines actually does not have recommendations as for the treatments, but they have classifications. So in the other hand, the JNC8 has recommendations and it's a little bit easy to remember their guidelines. So it's like, is it or two? Again. If you're less than 60 years old, it has to be lesser 140 over 90. And if you're over 60 years old, it has to be lesser 150 over 90. Clear? All right. So basically, I have a patient today that is very meticulous. He, he logs all his blood pressure because he is in tons of blood pressure medications. Um, so bottom line, he had hypotensive episode. So once you have this patient, once you have patients with a lot of blood pressure medications, you want to make sure to ask them if they have DC spells, you know, malipong or something, you feel like malipong sila, um, they have chest pain, any shortness of breathing, you know, the tendency to fall, any black blackouts or something. And um, just tell them that once they have a lot of blood pressure medications, they have to be cautious in their sudden movements. So, you know, common dizziness. So, also, you have to have um, to approach them to promote DASH diet. It is dietary approach to stop hypertension. Um, let's uh, make it um, simple. So, just like for high, for low cholesterol, you have to have a low sodium or ha basically heart healthy diet. Low sodium, um, low salt, low cholesterol, low fat diet. So, moving on. Kapwi. Moving on, high lipidemia. So basically, in a lipid panel, there should be total cholesterol, triglyceride, HDL, or healthy, or healthy um or a good cholesterol, LDL or the bad cholesterol. So basically, I have a patient that have some not so perfect um, lipid panel or cholesterol results. So you have to educate them about the diet. Aside from the medications that they are on, especially um, those that are a little bit big, they have history of um, um, family history of high cholesterol, 
you have to educate them about the difference of a good fat versus a bad fat in their diet. You want to make sure that you ask them what they like, but of course, you have to give suggestions as well. One of the good um, example is um, eating salmon, tuna, nuts, cashews, um, pecans, um, or avocado as well. Avocado is actually good and you can mix it up with your salad as well. Um, so just like for hypertension diet, you have to advise them with a low-fat diet, exercise every day, um, at least walking. You don't have to be very very vigorous running around really fast and I mean you just have to have at least 30 minutes of um, exercise or activity every day for at least like three to five times a week um, and also it's really important to assess in a primary care clinic the ASCVD score um, it's a little bit complicated to explain about the score but it is important for the the nurse practitioners or the physicians to evaluate the score of a patient that way to determine if they are in the right statin medications like if they should be in a low dose medium dose or the high dose um, cholesterol medications they say for example atorvastatin lipitor 10 milligrams 20 40 or 80 milligrams so you see there's some low dose a medium dose and a high dose and as a cardiac surgical nurse, there are some patients that actually does, didn't require um, open heart surgery, even though they have occlusion of their artery. That is because they have a big, wide collateral circulation. Collateral circulation is like, there's many vessels that grow around the, the arteries that's actually blocked. And I will put um, a picture, a sample picture right here. Um, and also I put a link of ASCVD risk um, estimator. Number three is urinalysis. Okay. So in an outpatient um, clinic, um, the doctors or the nurse practitioner or the clinic could actually test you your urine through a dipstick. And it is positive for UTI if there's nitrite. Of course, there's leukocytes, there's WBC, and of course, obviously, there is bacteria. Or, of course, you do that especially if the patient is complaining of dysuria or difficulty of urination or burning and urination. So, I have a patient today that have a history of recurrent urinary tract infection. Um, some common medications that you can give to this patient will be trimetropine, sulfametaxel, or Bactrim, or also nitrofurantoin macrobid. Um, this patient have a current PTI, so that should be a cue that it is really important that it's about time, or if never, if never done, you have to make sure you do a culture and sensitivity of the patient's urine. Because if she had a lot of antibiotics in the past, she might have developed some resistance. So because we have that result, we're able to determine what's the best medications to be given to this patient. And we end up giving Cefurexime Ceftin because she is sensitive with that medication. And hopefully she gets better when she gets back. So um, the only thing additional health teaching is that you have to ask them to continue um, sufficient water intake. And of course, if the patient is diabetic, um, you know, bacteria love sugar, so you have to ask them about, um, you have to, I mean, recommend a low sugar diet. Also basic, um, you have to ask women, um, male or especially women, to clean the perineal area from front to back. And also um, after finishing seven days of antibiotic, it's also best to add cranberry supplements. Um, I'm not actually a fan of juice, especially if this patient is diabetic. Diabetic, So um, it's good that I had earlier to go for cranberry pills than cranberry juice. That's it. And um, number four, diabetes. Okay, so let's say you have a fasting blood sugar it means like you're not gonna eat anything after midnight the sugar in the blood will be tested in the morning if it's high like probably like 
more than 100 a little bit tiny high like 101 105 it doesn't really mean that you are diabetic right away so the main thing or the basis for initiating oral hypoglycemic medications or insulin is the result of hemoglobin a1c um, that is basically the measure of your sugar control for the past three months so the normal is 5.5 to 7 um, so some patients that are that has hemoglobin a1c of 6 we um we can start them with an oral hypoglycemic um, medications but some patients actually don't want insulin at all or no medications at all because they are thinking that they should try to modify their diet first which is not bad um, don't have a problem about that that's actually good you know you don't want to mess up with your kidney with all those medications or whatsoever so again low carb diet sad to say for those diabetic um, supposedly rice is life but rice is not life because um, if you have to choose actually white rice versus brown rice i'm kind of guilty about that because i'm a big fan of white rice or jasmine rice but unfortunately brown rice is much much better and it's actually rich with protein which is good number five okay obesity all right obesity is a risk factor it's a modifiable risk factor so you can change change your life by just modifying your wealth or by just keeping an eye on your health all right so again advise your patient at least 30 minutes of low intensity exercise for at least three to five times a week of just walking and also low fat diet low salt diet low sodium diet no frozen foods a basically heart healthy diet again hi <sighs> number six bronchitis so this patient this morning came um, because of cough productive cough the lungs is actually clear and if there is only an on-site x-ray if there's no consolidation no infiltrates then definitely it is bronchitis again it is bronchitis if the patient has cough if the patient's lungs based on the x-ray has no consolidation and if you ask the patient to cough the ronchi will disappear after coughing it means to say it is um, bronchitis otherwise if if the lungs is after coughing and if there's infiltrates or consolidation in the x-ray then definitely that is pneumonia crystal clear and the first line of um, medications to give that patient is macrolide or those that ends with mycin. Like example, erythromycin, acetromycin, all those mycins. Um, it just so happened that this patient has a tonsillar cancer and also part of the... Um, uh, and he is in chemo radiation. So the side effect of the chemo radiation was atopic dermatitis. That is why we have to end up giving him a flucifosinonide that is an atopical treatment, a topical cream on the affected areas, especially on his upper and lower extremities. So another thing that I want to touch base about the tonsillar cancer that's actually rare, but one of the top living causes of tonsillar cancer is tobacco use, also alcohol, and is HPV, the human papilloma virus. That's one of the common causes. So you guys be careful, everybody be careful. So I'm down to second to the last, that is depression. All right, you have to ask a patient if they have a suicidal ideation, of course, if they have homicidal, homicidal um, ideation, of course, and also what is the first line of medications that you're gonna give for a patient that has depression. And of course, on top of that, there's a screening for depression that might be available when you're in the clinic, definitely. So first line, if I'll start a depression, depression medication to a patient, then that's gonna be SSRI. Why? Because um, it is considered safer and can cause um, fewer bothersome side effects or, you know, and those medications, example medications are this. I'm gonna put here. All right. Last one, um, gout. Oh, I need water. Anyway, so gout. 
my patient, my other patient, came with another complaint of leg pain. Leg pain, bilateral, and um, of course, you have to rule out everything. But bottom line, we asked about her diet, we asked about her history, she said she has history of gout, she's in medication, which is allopurinol, which is apparently not helping her, but hey, we have to ask for the diet. So, yun nga, I asked them. So, she really loves um, seafood. And the main thing is some patients that have gout, they, um, they, they're not aware um, that their diet is affecting their illness. So let's say um, it's actually a surprise for her. We asked her if she is taking or eating or fond of eating um, high purine rich foods. So those medica those those foods, um, example of those foods are this. And um, basically she was guilty of eating selfish. And um, some treat, um, one treatment for that is um, for flare-ups, we have to give them ibuprofen or Advil. And um, sometimes you may start them with indomethacin, but if it's just mild and um, the pain comes every now and then, on and off, then Advil will be fine. So um, that's it. Um, it was kind of like fast, but I try my best. A little bit concise. This is like top 10 diagnosis of my first day of clinical rotation so if you like everything i hope this helps you anyway if um, you guys want to pursue nurse practitioner um, course after taking your bachelor's of nursing i do encourage everybody to to push under career development or education and um I hope I see you guys next time. If you like the video, please like. If you want to subscribe, that's perfectly fine too. And um, but thank you for listening. Bye bye.